hello and welcome to uh, the next series of lectures in control engineering. So, uh, we are going to be looking at module 11 lecture 2 part 2 and uh, it is a continuation of the study we of the discussion we had on the inertial sensors. So, if you recall uh, in the last lecture, I had discussed the various effects of um, uh, sensor noise, uh, specifically accelerometer sensor noise and gyroscope sensor noise on, uh, the position, on the position computation. And whenever I say position, it could mean either translation or it could mean the rotation position the angular rotation position right <coughs> all right so <coughs> we saw a couple of things uh, one was that there are various types of noise uh, there is a constant bias the drifting bias angle random walk so on and so forth for the kind of applications we typically deal with in uh, in the consumer electronics and even sometimes to basic medical applications uh, it is enough for us to deal with the constant bias. So, if you are able to estimate the constant bias and then remove that, uh, you will get actually a very good uh, position estimation. Okay. So, the way that we are going to do it in this lecture, which will be immediately followed by um, a discussion on the actual implementation of this in both MATLAB and on a microcontroller. All right. So, that will be done by my research associate Vinay Sridhar. Um, we are going to start with the discussion of a high pass filter and we will see that we pass the gyroscope data which is the angular velocity through the high pass filter. We will then go to a low pass filter and basically we will be passing the accelerometer data through the low pass filter all right? and uh, we will then see how to combine the high pass filtered angle output with a low pass filter filtered angle output in order to get a much more accurate position computation. Okay. And again when I say position it could be either that x y z the transition position or the angular position uh, the roll pitch and your. Okay. So, let us go ahead and okay, uh, one last thing you should be very careful to remember this. We are going to be looking at computing <coughs> only two angular positions today and the first will be the pitch, the second will be the roll. Okay. We will not be computing the yaw. Uh, there is a specific reason for this with and it is basically that the accelerometer is a sensor which uh, for various reasons which I will not discuss here, uh, it is unable to compute the yaw angle which is the which is the rotation about the vertical axis right. It is able to compute only the pitch or the roll, it cannot compute the yaw. Uh, so, and we know that we can compute the yaw from the gyroscope because it can measure the angular rotation uh, uh, angular velocity about uh, the vertical axis. But we know that we cannot blindly use the gyroscope output because of drift, right. So, whenever you integrate the gyroscope output, we saw that before, right. So, if you take the vertical axis as a z axis and then you integrate uh, the angular velocity which you get about the z axis, you, you know that you are integrating two quantities, the true value about the z axis plus some noise and you know that this leads to drift. And what we are trying to claim in this lecture is if you combine the gyroscope with an accelerometer by using uh, these filters, you can actually reduce drift. But because we cannot compute uh, the yaw angle using the accelerometer, we will not compute the yaw angle directly with the gyroscope. Uh, there is actually another way of doing it, uh, which is uh, you combine uh, the gyroscope with a magnetometer and the magnetometer basically gives you the yaw angle okay, or the heading angle. 
so this can again be done in the same complementary filter technique that I am going to explain today uh, except that instead of the accelerometer we use a magnetometer all right uh, and that will be basically to combine the gyroscope and magnetometer in order to get the yaw angle. So, yaw is obtained from these guys. For today's lecture we are going to be focusing only on uh, combining the gyroscope and the accelerometer data uh, in order to compute the pitch and the roll ok. So, let us see how we are going to do that. Uh, so, before we go ahead uh, what we need to do is to first look at uh, what is a basic first order high pass filter and then we look at a low pass filter and then the complementary filter. Now, you may be surprised that uh, we are trying to do a real application over here and we are still just using first order filters. Well, it turns out that in most uh, practical applications in the industry as far as possible people try to prefer to use only first order and maybe if necessary second order filters. Uh, typically we do not like to go much higher than that at least in the area of navigation. Okay, so, what is a first order high pass filter? Uh, a physical representation of that could be something as simple as this. So, you have a RC filter basically, so the capacitor followed by a resistor R. Okay. So, if I then measure the voltage across this over here uh, that will be I will just call it as V out and we apply a voltage of the input terminals we call it V in. Now, this functions like uh, a high pass filter and uh, you already know that a high pass filter is nothing but what is called as a lead compensator. If you do not know this that is not an issue, but for those of you who are going to go into design of control systems the term lead compensator uh, essentially means a, a high pass filter and you will see later that a lag compensator is a, a low pass filter ok. Anyway, so this is the physical realization of the high pass filter. So, the first thing we will try to do is to derive the transfer function of this filter. <coughs> So, transfer function of the, the high pass filter ok. Uh, so some of you would have already seen this uh, with the basic derivation of electric circuits uh, and transfer functions. Uh, so, the way that we are going to do is as follows. So, let us look at V out the output voltage across the resistor terminals. It is nothing but let us say a current I is flowing clockwise in the circuit. It is I times R. <clears throat> okay, so, let us keep this aside all right. So, this I times R. Now, um, we know the basic one of the basic constitutive relationships between the charge and the voltage drop across the uh, across the capacitor which is basically Q is C times V ok. Now, if we take a look at our capacitor over here, uh, the voltage drop across the capacitor. So, let me just write this down. So, the voltage drop across uh, my capacitor C is basically V in minus V out. Okay. So, this then implies that Q is nothing but uh, V in minus V out. <clears throat> okay, this I will call it as step number 2. Okay, now, uh, we go to step number 3 where we know the basic relationship between the charge in the capacitor and the current flowing through the capacitor which is that I is equal to dQ by dt. Okay. And then we substitute this expression for Q over here back into this derivative term and uh, you basically get d by dt C of V in minus V out ok. So, this uh, can be written as C d d t V in minus V out. So, that is the expression for the current through the capacitor ok. Now, uh, substitute uh, uh, into 1 
Okay, what are we going to substitute? The expression for the current into 1. So, substitute 3 into 1. This would give V out is nothing but C d d t V in minus V out times R. All right. So, uh, this is R C d V in by d t uh, minus d V out by d t. Okay, that is basically the expression that you are going to get. So, if I now uh, write all of this in a Laplace transform domain, so transform I will call this as this entire equation as equation number 4. So, transform 4 into a Laplace domain and what do we get? Well, we get uh, V out of S and on the, on the right hand side you would get R C times S V in of S that is because the d by dt term in the Laplace domain it is S all right. Uh, minus R C minus R C S uh, V out of S okay. this is the expression we get. So, take this term on to the left hand side and take the V out of S term uh, common and you will basically get V out of S into 1 plus R C S on the left hand side is equal to R C S into V in of S. Now, we know the definition of the transfer function, it is a ratio of the output re response to the input signal. So, we get G of S equal to V out S divided by V in of S all right, and that will be nothing but the transfer function of a first order high pass filter. Okay, so, this is the cool little guy we have been trying to derive all along. Okay. So, it is a transfer function of the first order high pass filter. Now, uh, for those of you who are already comfortable in MATLAB, what you can go ahead and do uh, is to, well, let me erase, I will make some space over here. So, that I can write, okay, that is enough. Let me not spoil this anymore. Okay, so, for those of you who are comfortable uh, with MATLAB by now, what you can do uh, is to take different values of R and C, and you can use the command TF in MATLAB uh, in order to define your system, uh, the high pass filter. So, uh, we can actually call it system or you can call it a filter if you like that is a better word. So, we can call it HPF filter is equal to transfer function of the numerator comma denominator. Okay. In this and the way you would write it down in MATLAB is basically numerator is so you have a S term over here. So, it would be R C and there is no constant term, so that is a 0, that is a vector, right. And the denominator term would be you have a constant term 1 and you have R C over here. Okay, so, you, you can define a transfer function in MATLAB for uh, different values of R and C and then you can go ahead and try to look at uh, you know the Bode, the Bode plot of, um, of your high pass filter. So, the Bode plot, plot HPF of the high pass filter. So, this is a command in MATLAB. So, when you actually uh, plot the Bode plot of the high pass filter, let me raise make some more space over here. Right, you are actually going to get um, you should if you do if you do it carefully, you are going to get a Bode magnitude plot. We will not worry about the phase over here too much, uh, where this is in a log scale, the frequency on the um, x axis and then you have the magnitude of uh, g of s in decibels. And this being a high pass filter, you would actually expect to see a magnitude plot of this type, right? where this is the cutoff frequency. 
f c. Uh, all of you know how we can calculate the cutoff frequency. So, we have the high pass uh, frequency response plot over here and uh, you see the cutoff frequency is, is shown over here actually it should be slightly over here around the 3 dB point. So, let me correct that. Um, Okay, let me draw this again. Okay, that is a better plot. Okay, so this is your cutoff frequency. And the cutoff frequency, uh, as all of you know, you can compute with the expression 1 over 2 pi Rc. Okay, uh, so given the values of R and C, you know now what is the specific cutoff frequency which, uh, which you can actually use. All right. Um, so, what have we done in this slide? We have derived uh, the transfer function of a high pass filter. We have seen what are the command we need to use to plot the Bode plot uh, to, to, to first of all define the transfer function in MATLAB, then plot the Bode plot, uh, the, uh, the, the frequency response in MATLAB and you will actually get something like this, the magnitude part. You can see a similar one for the phase. Now, with this, uh, you need to remember that this is a continuous time time filter, right. Uh, of course, uh, what we would like to actually do is to use this in discrete time on a computer or in a microcontroller. So, we will actually need to go for a discrete for a discrete time version of this continuous time filter, okay, that is what we will actually need to uh, do and this is what I am going to do in the next slide. So, okay, so we have uh, the same uh, high pass filter, so we had the, the capacitor and the resistor, right. And for this we got uh, the basic expression for the output across a capacitor as a function of um, the uh, other variables. Now, if you look at each of these variables, let us just plot the input V in as a function of time and also the output um, V out as a function of time. So, let us say V in is some signal like that and uh, okay, so we have the output filtered version something like this. Now, this is a continuous time, uh, what you actually do is to pass this through a A to D converter and you take it into your microcontroller or into your computer or something like that and when you do that you actually only have just discrete samples right so you may have this 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 so on depending on how fast your sampling rate is right and the same for the output as well so you will not have the continuous signal you will just have discrete parts of that and so on for all the other points as well so, um, how would we represent that? Well, one way to do it is to actually use the notation over here. So, the input signal V in, uh, you can see here the input signal V in, right. So, it is a, it is a collection of points. So, I will call the first point as x1, I can call the second point as x2, uh, x3, so on and so forth, right. So, that is what I have done over here. So, this n which you have uh, will depend on the sampling rate and for how much time you have actually collected the data. Okay? So, it can be a really large number if you collect data for a few minutes. So, this will be essentially the discrete version of the continuous time signal. So, these collection of points is a discrete version of this continuous time signal. In the same way, uh, we measure the output, we again uh, collect all the discrete uh, samples over here and we call that as y of 1, y of 2, so on till y of n. Okay? Now, when you do this, um, we, we need to now basically plug these two expressions back into this equation uh, and we know that d by dt in the difference time would basically uh, be converted, would basically be converted to a difference equation and you have seen this difference equation come about in uh, when we computed uh, the angular position if we had a, a measurement as angular velocity, right. 
or we computed the basic velocity when we had uh, the acceleration measurement with us. So, we did a single integration in both cases. Uh, so, that is basically your difference equation. So, how would this look if I actually write down the difference equation? So, the dv i n by d t. So, remember that v i n was nothing but x of 1, x of 2, so on till x of n depending on how much time you have collected your data. So, d by d t of d uh, of v i n would be nothing but i the current sample minus the previous sample okay, divided by the amount of time difference between these two samples okay, and the time difference will be essentially uh, your sampling rate which you are looking at. Um, okay, so, that is how you write d by dt v in and we know that we had written v out as y of 1, y of 2, so on till y of n and in exactly the same way d v out would be nothing but y the current sample which I am measuring minus the previous sample divided by the time difference between the two samples ok and that is basically what we have over here. Now, if I take this expression, so, so remember we are multiplying this uh, with R c as we see here and you do uh, very simple algebraic manipulations ok and the derivation is given over here, you will end up with this final expression ok. So, uh, what does the final expression look like? Let me just write this down again. So, the output at the current time is a function of some constants ok. Uh, so, this is actually a time constant, let us call as R c ok, uh, is a function of the of these constants times the current input minus the previous input plus again we have these constants over here and the previous output which we measured last time all right. Um, so, what we do is to replace this note uh, with a different notation. So, we, we will typically call R c as tau the time constant and we will call because this is a high pass filter uh, ok. So, we will have R c divided by R c plus delta t which in our case is nothing but uh, tau by tau plus delta t and this entire term we are going to denote by alpha high pass filter ok. So, it basically means the current output uh, after the filtering right. The current output is alpha high pass filter times x i minus x i minus 1 plus alpha high pass filter y of i minus 1. This is the expression that we are going to be using in the discrete time implementation ok and we are actually going to show an example of this in MATLAB as well as in a microcontroller code ok. So, this is um, uh, what we are going to do with the high pass filter. We have seen how to compute uh, the frequency response, we have seen how to compute uh, the cutoff frequency by ok. So, if I go back we have seen that the cutoff frequency um, uh, let us use a different color ok. So, the cutoff frequency was over here 1 over 2 pi r c. Now, we know that tau is basically r c right uh, which is nothing but the time constant and we will see in the next lecture how to specifically to choose this value of tau uh, based on the design constraints that uh, we we have to consider uh, which may which may depend on how fast your motion is, what kind of filtering you want to use and so on ok. So, this will be done in the next lecture by Vinay Sridhar all right very good. So, that is a first order high pass filter um, and just to recall the gyroscope angular measurement data uh, after computing the angle is going to be passed through this high pass filter ok, we will see that. Okay, now, let us look at a low pass filter. So, how would uh, a physical realization of a low pass filter look like? Well, 
you would have a resistor followed by the capacitor over there okay and then we of course would write V out a signal over here this is your R and this is your C. Now why do not we apply uh, KVL and C what we are going to get so let us say you have a current over here and if I apply KVL you would actually get minus V in because I am going in a clockwise direction uh, plus I times R plus the voltage drop across the capacitor which is the same as V out is equal to 0 ok this is by KVL. Now um, the current uh, in this loop is the same as the current which, which is passing through the capacitor and what is the expression of the current which is passing through the capacitor I is basically C dV out by dt right that is uh, the expression number 2 and we substitute now 2 in 1. So, this gives us minus V in plus R dV out by dt plus V out equals 0. Transform this to the Laplace domain okay, and remember that d by dt in the Laplace domain is basically S. Okay. So, when you transform this to the Laplace domain you are going to get minus V in of S plus R times S times V out of S plus V out of S is equal to 0 and now all you need to do is to simplify this expression. Um, so, we take V in on the right hand side and take the V out term common over here. So, this would imply uh, V out into uh, ok I am sorry there should be a C over here because I is equal to C dV by dt. So, in this expression when I replaced I uh, I had forgotten to include the C anyway. So, the C comes over here you will also have a C over here all right good. So, now you take V out common and you would basically have 1 plus R C S on the left hand side on the right hand side you will just have V in this of course gives us the transfer function which is the output response to the input signal okay, which is 1 over 1 plus R C uh, R C S. This is the transfer function of the low pass filter and as before if you uh, try to compute the frequency response of this and you look at the magnitude plot uh, you will get uh, response like this. So, this is omega in a log scale this is the magnitude in decibels ok and this would be your cutoff frequency once again it is equal to 1 over 2 pi r c very similar to the high pass filter derivation. So, good so that is the low pass filter and uh, now let us ok. So, as we discussed before uh, all of this is a continuous time implementation and what we will actually need uh, is to have, um, so we need a discrete time version of this filter because we want to put all of this into a microcontroller or a, or, or, or a computer. So, how are you going, we going to get a discrete time version ok. discrete time low pass filter and to be very specific this is a first order low pass filter. So, we are going to use uh, this basic expression of the continuous time filter to compute our discrete time filter ok. So, let us recall that. So, minus V in S plus R C S V out plus V out of S ok. So, uh, let me change the color to red ok. So, we had uh, was this KVL what we used uh, yes indeed. So, this was so we had the, uh, the expression from the Kirchhoff's voltage law and it was derived as minus V in S 
plus R C uh, okay R C okay let us do this again. So, with this expression from the Kirchhoff voltage law which was minus V in of T plus R C D uh, V out by D T uh, minus R plus plus V out of T okay this was equal to 0. Let us try to write down the discrete time equivalent of this one in a similar way as we did before. So, um, let me choose blue okay. So, we have V in described by a sequence of points x 1, x 2 so on till x of n right. Similarly, we had V out described by a sequence of points y 1, y 2 so on till y n all right. Why do not we substitute this and this and we will see what this looks like. Remembering that uh, the derivative of the continuous time will become a difference equation in the discrete time. Okay. So, let me choose a nicer color now, let us choose a funny green. Okay. So, what will happen? Uh, first let me take V in on to the right hand side. So, uh, you will only be left with these terms on the left hand side. Okay. So, R C are obviously constants and the d by dt now becomes a difference equation which will basically be uh, let us not say v out uh, let us use the term y. So, we will actually say y of i which is the current sample plus y of i minus 1 the previous sample divided by delta t okay, plus you have v out over here. So, it will just be again uh, y of i the current sample and we had taken v in of t onto the right hand side. So, uh, the v in of t will simply be um, uh, x of i. Okay. Um, I hope you have noticed I made a small mistake over here uh, which was no okay. All right, so um, this is color green. So this was I and this was I. Okay, so let us see how we actually compute uh, this relationship. So we multiply everywhere with delta t, and we will get R C y of i minus R C y i minus one. Now delta t goes over here multiplying with y of i and also on the right hand side okay multiplying with x of i so from this uh, not that one let's take the other one so uh, from this term and this term well, let me take y of i common out so i get y of i times r c plus delta t okay and uh, let me take this term over here onto the right hand side so, this will be nothing but delta t times x of i plus r c times y of i minus 1. Okay. Now, you can see that I can divide with r c plus delta t which will go onto the right hand side and then eventually I will have my expression for y of i. So, this will be nothing but delta t divided by r c plus delta t times x of i plus R c divided by R c plus delta t times y of i minus 1. Now, as we did before, let me um, simplify this expression by denoting alpha to be delta t divided by R c plus delta t. All right. So, if alpha is is delta t by r c plus delta t. I will also call this as the low pass alpha. In that case, 1 minus uh, alpha LPF will be nothing but 1 minus delta t by r c plus delta t, which is the same as r c by r c plus delta t. Okay. So, let me use this expression and this expression in this equation 
and we get the final discrete time realization uh, of a first order low pass filters. So, that is y of i is equal to alpha L p f times x of i plus 1 minus alpha L p f times y i minus 1. Okay. So, uh, we started off with the continuous time uh, version of the filter over here and through these steps we have now arrived at the discrete time version of the filter. Okay. And again uh, RC is nothing but your time constant, delta t is the time difference between two, between two samples. So, depending on what data you have you will appropriately choose the RC okay. and we will see this in an example uh, by Vinay Sridhar in the next lecture. Very good. So, now that we have a high pass filter and we have a low pass filter, uh, what is the idea of this? Why are we doing all this? Well, the idea of this is that uh, we want to uh, create something called a complementary filter and the complementary filter takes the best of both worlds. It takes the best that the accelerometer data can give us and it takes the best that the gyroscope data can give us. Okay. Let us see what I mean by that is as follows. Using the accelerometer data okay, and we will go more into detail in the next lecture by Vinay Sridhar, we can actually compute two angles. We can compute the roll and we can compute the pitch. Okay. Using the gyroscope data and after we numerically integrate the angular, angular rotation which we get over here, so this is a numerical integration, we can also compute the roll and the pitch. So, this is from the axle and this is from the gyro. Okay. Now, um, we have seen a specific problem with the gyroscope that because of numerical integration, I get the problem of drift. Okay, so, if I just use the gyroscope alone in order to compute uh, these angles, eventually if my real angle is supposed to be some 30 degrees, my actual angle may just keep uh, drifting away okay, forever and you, you can have an unbounded error which is not good. So, why do not we use just an accelerometer? The problem with an accelerometer is uh, that it is susceptible or you can say corrupted, it is susceptible to very small changes which is basically uh, I am saying high frequency uh, components, it is susceptible to very small changes in the environment and it picks up everything, it is a very sensitive sensor. So, if I place an accelerometer on my hand right, just suppose this pen is an accelerometer and I am doing these motions, so the accelerometer will pick it up, I do want to track this. Now, while the pen is on my hand, even if I just tap very lightly, very, very lightly, the accelerometer is sensitive enough to pick up those kind of vibrations as well and those start to come into the equations and you're, you, you are going to get erroneous um, answers. Furthermore, um, accelerometer data as, as explained um, just now is susceptible to um, high frequency noise. So, if you keep an accelerometer at a perfectly stable condition and we would expect the data to be something like this along one axis of the accelerometer, because of this high frequency noise and vibrations in the atmosphere all around you, you actually would be getting data like this. Okay, this is high frequency data and that is not good. Um, it does not drift, but it does not give you good accuracy. Uh, what you can do to remove this high frequency drift, uh, uh, this high frequency noise is to actually pass all of this through a low pass filter right? and then you can actually get a much cleaner response. And what we would do with the gyroscope is to pass it through a high pass filter uh, primarily for the reason that a gyroscope is very accurate in computing the, the high speed dynamics. It is not so good uh, when your dynamics are really low speed. So, and then when you combine the gyroscope with the accelerometer, the accelerometer ensures that the gyroscope does not keep drifting away because it tries to bring it back because accelerometer does not drift. 
So, the basic construction uh, which Vinay will be talking in more detail in the next lecture is that we have the accelerometer data in all three axes. So, that is A x, A y and A z all of this going uh, into let us say an angle computation block we will see exactly how to do that and this will be then passed through a low pass filter. Then we have the gyroscope data which will again uh, you will take omega x, omega y, omega z the angular velocities uh, do a numerical integration and pass it through an angle com well and that actually gives you the angles directly there is no angle computation block as such. So, this gives you the angles directly after the numerical integration with drift and you pass it through a high pass filter. And what you then do is to combine both the outputs in order to get a complementary filter output. And how does this look like? Well, it is a little interesting. So, let me erase this. Uh, stuff over here. So, we know what the frequency response of an accelerometer would uh, of, of a low pass filter looks like right. So, if the low pass if the frequency response of the low pass filter looks like this with this being the cutoff frequency f c the frequency response of a high pass filter uh, would actually be like this ok. And let us assume that we are clever enough to choose exactly the same cutoff frequency ok. Uh, so, this is we are looking at the magnitude plot ok. Uh, what this tries to behave is like a all pass filter. So, if you pass in exactly the same signal ok, if you pass in exactly the same signal uh, through this filter we will just call some signal as q you pass q through a low pass filter you pass the same to a high pass filter both with the same cutoff frequencies the and then you add them up the combination of this behaves like a all pass filter ok. We will not go more into details of this uh, except to point out at this stage uh, that we are looking at filters with gains or magnitudes of 1, so that we do not amplify or attenuate the signals ok. So, given that so given that we will see in the next lecture by Vinay Sridhar um, how the use of this complementary filter uh, the, the, the combination of a low pass and a high pass. Uh, how the use of this will actually lead to much more accurate uh, say computation of the angles. Uh, and we will also see that if you have really high speed motion I want to trust my gyroscope more. If I have low speed motion I want to trust my accelerometer more right. So, if you look at it in the frequency response context if I have high frequency I want this part of the frequency response curve to be activated right because uh, if I have high speed dynamics I really want this to be a activated. If I have low speed dynamics meaning my bandwidth of the system is low I do not really want to use this region it is it is pointless it it starts to bring in noise and other problems. So, in that case I want to activate this part of the frequency response how how we would do that well we would do that by writing the complementary filter by using a special parameter called alpha alpha complementary filter and you multiply this uh, with the angle which is coming in from the accelerometer ok. And you multiply exactly 1 minus alpha with the angle coming in from the gyroscope alright and you would uh, so again it is CPF. So, you would choose your alpha to be such that if my dynamics are really fast dynamics. I would like to trust this one more. So, for fast dynamics ok, I would like to trust the gyroscope 
and how would I tell the equation to trust the gyroscope? Well, you simply put alpha to be fairly low, almost close to 0 for really fast dynamics. For slow dynamics, I like to trust uh, my accelerometer more. So, you let alpha C P F almost get cl close to 1. You of course, in reality you would never use 0 and 1 because you remember the problem with drift that the gyroscope has. So, you would always want to make sure your accelerometer angles are always coming in uh, to prevent that drift. So, it will not be really zeros or 1s, it will be small numbers greater than 0, large numbers but less than 1. Okay? And Vinay Sridhar in the next lecture will explain this in more detail with a couple of nice experiments as well. Okay, so, to conclude this uh, talk, uh, we had started out by recalling um, some of the effects of sensor noise on position computation, translation and, and, and rotation position computation. Um, we looked at uh, two specific implementations, uh, uh, the discrete time implementation of the high pass filter and the low pass filter and we saw very briefly, we will go more into detail into the next lecture, how the use of a complementary filter can give us far more accurate uh, results. Okay? Uh, what I want you to remember is that uh, the MATLAB code and the microcontroller code that we have developed, we will be actually sharing it with all of you on the forum. Uh, so, you are welcome to experiment with uh, the codes that we are going to give you, the data that we are going to give you and you can actually design your own uh, navigation filter. Okay, um, so, we saw in the previous um, two, three slides, uh, we basically wrote down, um, what was that? The discrete time realization or implementation of the high pass and the low pass filters, right? And the low pass filters. Now, um, let us see once again why uh, we would like to pass uh, the gyroscope measurements through a high pass filter and the accelerator, accelerometer measurements through a low pass filter and then we will see the role of the complementary filter. Okay? So, first let us take the accelerometer. If you actually uh, look at the accelerometer data uh, which we will also be pr providing to you on the forum, uh, even when you keep the accelerometer in a perfectly stationary condition. Uh, and we expect to see, let us take along any particular axis, we can take along the x axis as a function of time. Uh, so, if it is stationary, uh, you would expect to see around the 0 value, maybe some minor variation like this, right. So, there is almost no variation and that is actually what we expect to see when the accelerometer is perfectly stationary. Uh, so, this is basically the noise. Um, primarily because of bias, right. So, instead of being at 0, it gets offset to a certain value, which we can remove by, uh, by calibration. Uh, this is what we would expect to see. Now, when you mount this on any stationary surface and let us say you are walking around that surface or you tap on your table or you shake your table very gently, any motion uh, can be easily picked up by your accelerometer because it is very sensitive. So, instead of seeing uh, the slight variation, uh, which is basically an offset, the, the bias offset with some other noise parameters, the accelerometer is capable of picking up even minor vibrations in the environment. And you may actually see uh, the stationary accelerometer data to be something like this. Right? So, um, this is the kind of uh, actual measurements which you get from the accelerometer and this, well, it has many different terminology. One of it, uh, we can say that it is called as jitter. So, these are the high frequency components which any minor vibrations in the environment, the high frequency vibrations is, are easily picked up by the accelerometer and then, uh, and then measured and then you, you see them over there. Now, because of the nature of these vibrations which are typically high frequency, if you pass this through a low pass filter okay, and if you do a really good job at that, we would actually expect 
to see back our nice little accelerometer data okay, where the, the high frequency components are removed. Of course, this is in an ideal condition, it is never this perfect, uh, you may actually get something like this, right? but that is still far better than what you are seeing in the previous plot. So, that is for the accelerometer uh, and that is the reason why we uh, pass the accelerometer data through a uh, low pass filter. Let us look at the gyroscope data. Okay. So, if you keep your gyroscope in a perfectly stationary condition, again you, uh, you would expect and remember this is angular rotation, uh, angular, uh, angular rotation over there, this is time you would again expect to see some fairly mild uh, signal like that and it is not exactly at 0 because you have an offset or what is also called as a bias. Now, um, unlike in the accelerometer case, uh, the offset is present in all the axes. So, when you compute the angles through the accelerometer, we would use trigonometric expressions of the type uh, tan inverse acceleration x divided by square root of acceleration y square plus acceleration z square. And what actually happens then is um, uh, you would have a small bias measurement in each one of them, all right. but because you are dividing one bias with the other bias terms, so, this, so the total bias contribution is quite small. So, although this is not uh, the true angle it is still not too bad. Okay? You are slightly erroneous, but it is not as if you are going to drift away uh, completely from the true angle. In the case of the gyro, as we have already seen before, this is not true. Uh, and, the, and the reason for that is basically because we are integrating uh, the signal. And when you integrate the signal, you also integrate this bias over there. So, what you would actually get is uh, if the true angle is supposed to be somewhere like this, let us say 0 degrees, I will call this 0 degrees, your bias is actually going, uh, the integrating uh, the angular rotation rate is going to produce a bias of that nature, all right? because it is a fixed bias, you have a linear uh, drift over there. So, how to solve this problem? Well, what you can do is to simply pass this through a high pass filter. And what happens when you pass uh, this signal through a high pass filter? It would try to pass all of the gyroscope data except the bias which is a constant offset. right? And a constant DC signal uh, through a high pass filter is simply attenuated off. right? And when you do that, so uh, then you would not have too much of a drift your drift will be significantly reduced. Of course, depending on how well you choose your high pass filter uh, coefficients. So, accelerometer uh, data is passed through a low pass filter and the reason for that is to remove jitter or the high frequency noise. The gyroscope data is passed through a high pass filter of course, after the integration uh, to remove drift. That is a basic idea of what we do with the high pass and the low pass filter. What do we do with the complementary filter? Well, we do something um, more interesting. So, now let us look at the complementary filter. Let us say that we have uh, high speed motion, high speed dynamics say you are in a plane and then it is going at extreme uh, speeds, uh, your rotation speeds or low speed motion. Right, so, the aircraft is moving very gently. Now, um, because of the nature of the two sensors which we have, it turns out uh, the gyroscope can actually capture the high speed motion very well. In fact, uh, typical gyroscopes have fairly uh, high bandwidth like what? 2000 degrees per second. Okay. Uh, and it is in the order of a few thousand degrees per second, whereas accelerometers have very low bandwidth. Okay? and it is meant to capture really the low speed dynamics. So, we would like to capture the low speed dynamics with the accelerometer and the high speed dynamics with the gyroscope. So, how would you do this? Well, uh, so we know that from the gyroscope we get an angle, 
uh, after doing the high pass filtering. So, I will just call it as theta high pass filtered angle and this has come out of the gyroscope. Out of the accelerometer we compute the angle and then we pass it through the low pass filter. So, we get another angle over here I have called it theta LPF. Now, how do we combine these two angles in such a way that we can capture both high speed dynamics, we can capture low speed dynamics or we can capture any dynamics in between okay, because there is no guarantee your dynamics is always high speed or always low speed. And the way you would do that is by the use of the complementary filter and it is a very simple equation. So, the output uh, coming out of the complementary filter the angular position is nothing but a coefficient which uh, we will see how to calculate in later lectures by Vinay Sridhar. Uh, the coefficient of the complementary filter uh, this is multiplied with the angle coming out of the accelerometer plus 1 minus alpha times the angle coming out of the high pass filter which is the gyroscope output. Okay. How does this equation solve our problems? Well, let us say that we have really high speed dynamics I would like to trust my gyroscope more because it can actually it has very high bandwidth it can capture these high speed dynamics far better. If I want to trust my gyroscope more then I would like to actually use this far more than using the angle from the low pass filter uh, from the accelerometer. How would I do that? Well, I will simply set the coefficient to be uh, small not 0, but small uh, maybe okay. uh, if I have predominantly low speed dynamics. Uh, then I would like to trust the angle coming out of the accelerometer more than the angle coming out of the gyro. Why is that? We know that gyro integration is affected by bias. Okay? Even though you have done a high pass filter of the gyro there is, there is always a little bit of residual bias left. And if the dynamics are really towards the low speed dynamics we are forced to choose the cutoff frequency of the high pass filter actually very close. Um, to the left axis. So, let us draw that over here. If you have very high speed dynamics say 100 hertz and above or 20 hertz and above I can choose my high pass filter to have a cutoff frequency let us say more than 20 hertz. But if I have very low speed dynamics and I want to pass it through my gyroscope I will need a cutoff frequency much closer like this. right? And the problem with coming closer and closer to uh, the lower frequencies is that I am actually going to pass in my bias that is going to uh, get added up in the integration process and you are going to have the problem with drift. So, whenever you have low speed dynamics we really do not like to use the gyroscope, we do not trust the gyroscope data. In that case what you would do? You would use the coefficient to be as large as possible. Of course, what do I mean by small, what do I mean by large? Well, the basic idea is that al alpha of the complementary filter it lies between 0 and 1. So, let us say we are absolutely sure that our vehicle will experience very high speed um, dynamics. In that case, I would like to trust my gyro more. right? So, I would actually set alpha to be almost close to 0, maybe even 0. If I am always going to have very low speed dynamics 1 hertz, 2 hertz kind of dynamics I would start to prefer to trust my accelerometer more. right? In that case I will set alpha to be very close to 1 so that the gyroscope data is not being used. So, the interpretation of a complementary filter is basically we choose the coefficient in such a way that we trust either the gyroscope. Uh, measurements or we trust the accelerometer measurements. Uh, this is true of course for extreme readings. For any readings in between let us say that you have medium speed dynamics so neither too fast nor too slow then maybe we trust both the uh, se sensors equally well in which case I would choose alpha CPF to be maybe somewhere close to 0.5. Okay? So, that is the basic idea of the complementary filter. And we will see in the next lectures how Vinay Sridhar is going to actually use his complementary filter uh, to actually compute angles uh, on a real, in a real experiment. Okay?